Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third part or third day of the NEC Users Group Online Virtual Conference. Hopefully, you've had some value out of the sessions you've attended previously, and hopefully today's will also inform you and give you some more background and information on how the NEC is being used successfully on an international basis. My name is Ian Heafy. I'll be chairing the session today. I'm a member of the NEC4 Contract Board, and I'm actually pleased to say that I've been involved with all of the teams who are speaking today in some form, working with them on their international projects. Um, so a bit of housekeeping to start off with. Can you, if you're not speaking, please mute your microphone and also turn off your video. That just saves on a bandwidth to make sure we get a good connection. So, so if you're not speaking, please do put your microphones on mute. As we go through the different presentations, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. So feel free to actually raise your questions during the presentation through the chat window on the side of the screen. And you can either ask your question in full in the chat, or if you'd like to actually articulate your question, simply give your name, say that you have a question. And then when we get to the Q&A session, I can come back to you and ask you to uh, ask your question. We've got a fairly tight agenda to get through, so hopefully we'll get a chance to go through some questions, but any questions that remain outstanding, you can always ask those through to the NEC users group who can help provide answers. I'd first like to start off by thanking our sponsors who are supporting the event. Without our sponsors, obviously, we can't put on these types of uh, sessions for the users, so thank you to all of the various sponsors. We now have a short video from a spot from our sponsor for the session today, Think Project. Uh, there's no sound to this video, so uh, don't think it's not working. It's just a visual presentation. Okay, so thank you to our sponsor, Think Project. I'm now going to hand over to Shai Jackson, who is going to present on the international application of NEC. Shai Jackson may be familiar to many of you. He's a partner with Pinsent Masons. Shai's practice covers project advice and dispute resolution, and he's advised on UK and international infrastructure projects under various standard forms of construction contracts, including, of course, the NEC. He's acted in court proceedings, adjudication, arbitration, as well as ADR. He's recognised for his expertise in Who's Who's Legal Construction 2020, where he's listed as a thought leader, as well as in the Legal 500 and Chambers and Partners 2019, where he's referred to as very knowledgeable, a safe pair of hands when it comes to construction litigation, and very able and approachable with particularly sharp commercial acumen. So watch out for Shai, Shai going forward. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineering Surveyors, and elected member of the Society of Construction Law Council. He writes regularly for industry publications, including the NEC newsletter, and contributes to construction law textbooks, and is a visiting lecturer at the Construction Law MSc course at King's College London, and the Masters in Business and Engineering at the University of Stuttgart. So, Shai, after that introduction, I leave it over to you to take us through NEC in an international context. Um, thanks very much, Ian. I hope everyone can hear me. My session is not about any specific projects, but more about some of the general themes that come up when people talk about the use of NEC internationally. I think we've seen from the awards that NEC has been used outside the UK for quite some time. And I think the real question is, how can it continue to expand and become the contract of choice? And if we can move to the next slide, there was one point that I wanted to make initially, which is sometimes not as obvious as it should be. There is no contract that you can just take off the shelf and use in any jurisdiction, confident that it will work the way you want it to. It is correct that all jurisdictions tend to respect contractual freedom and enforce contracts, but every jurisdiction will have its own laws, and the UK Construction Act being a good example, which can make common clauses used internationally unenforceable, for example, on conditional payments. And similarly, different legal systems work differently, 
and provisions, for example, on delay damages or time bar clauses will be treated differently under civil law or post-sharia law. And you can't assume that they will give you the same certainty as if perhaps you are used to an English law perspective. Why clauses help with that? They are designed to manage some of the local issues, but they tend to be used more for legislation that is mandatory, like the Construction Act, and its equivalents in places like Australia and other jurisdictions that have introduced um, security of payment legislation. But in any event, the reality is that you will need a local law review. And my final point on that is that you, can't, you can usually choose the law of the contract, and you can try and go for English law, for example, if that helps avoid some of the issues, depending on what the procuring authority determines. But you do need to be aware that other things will be governed through local laws. So if you're looking at government acts and taxation, or what will govern permits and planning issues, this will probably be covered by local law. Similarly, employment law will tend to be local. And, and things like the capacity of parties to enter into a contract, for example, execution formalities, will probably be covered by their own domestic law, as will be their insolvency if that happens. And then, of course, if you're looking at subcontracts or supply contracts, they may well be with under international, other international parties, and they may not be covered by the same legal system or governing or clause as the main contract and they may not be as back-to-back -back as you might hope them to be. So it, it is something to bear in mind when you're considering the use of NEC internationally. Now, for NEC to grow, it needs the experience and track record. We've seen how much it is being used internationally. From my experience, I think what is really interesting is that there have been a lot of international contractors who are operating in the UK are very active here. And you can see the Spanish, French or German contractors. And what it means is that an Austrian or German engineer will spend a few years in the UK working on NEC, sometimes referred to as NEC, and then they go back and talk about it. And whatever experience they have, it raises awareness. And it's something that we've noticed. Ten years ago, international bodies would come and ask for a basic introduction to NEC. This is no longer the case. They're becoming a lot more sophisticated and a lot familiar with NEC and more interested in how it can work. And of course, it's been used in many places internationally. And I think the real question is, with the contractors moving around and having their own experiences, how do we get clients, government body, international banks to get more experience of NEC? And that's why I thought if we look at Hong Kong, which is obviously a very good example, very briefly, and move to the next slide. I was speaking to one of my partners in our Hong Kong office who was really impressed in how, with how NEC was adopted in Hong Kong so much quicker than it was in the UK. And he gave me his impressions of why this happened. And of course, it is a small jurisdiction, relatively speaking, with quite a lot of infrastructure work. But his perspective was that the most important factor was that there was a genuine government desire and it was effectively client-led. And I think we all need to recognize that unless clients want to try NEC, understanding why and how it works, it's not really gonna happen. And that's what you've had in Hong Kong. And we've seen some really great examples of all those projects in Hong Kong. And you get the sense that it is all being driven centrally, it is coordinated, and NEC is used consistently and not just on a one-off basis. And that worked very well in Hong Kong. It's got some unique features, but I still think there's some really good lessons that other jurisdictions can learn from Hong Kong on how to implement NEC. And then moving to the next slide, the importance of language. I thought I should mention it because probably like many other people on the call, I am not a native English speaker and I like NEC because I find it really easy to read and understand. And we sometimes forget that contracts should be drafted by the people who use them on site. And you should not need legal training to understand what the clause requires and what are your obligations under the contract. And the drafting style of NEC is very good in that respect. It's approachable, easy to understand, and it also makes it easy to translate, subject, of course, to getting NEC permission for doing that. And in some places, 
translation is compulsory, it may be a requirement of local law, but I would suggest that you need to be cautious about translations. A good translation of a legal document is really difficult. It has to be done by somebody who understands both languages very well and understands the legal background and why certain clauses have been drafted in the way they have in order to ensure that even when translated, they still have the same result. If it's not done properly, if you're going for a bit of a quick translation, it can cause more harm than confusion. And if possible, sometimes it might be easier to stick to the English version rather than take the risk with a translation, which may not quite get the spirit of NEC in the way that it's intended to. And if we move to the next slide, collaboration. And again, we've heard some of the prize winners speak about collaboration, how important it is. And of course, it is by a big part of NEC. We know how big it is in the UK. And to an extent, it is helped by a market with non-players who have long-term relationships. But we shouldn't underestimate how much interest collaboration generates outside the UK. And just before lockdown happened, we did a training session in our Madrid office with our Spanish clients. And I've asked my Spanish partner if there would be any interest in hearing about collaboration and how it works. And she said it would be very interesting. And she made the point that people outside the UK sometimes think that English law and how we manage contracts and disputes in the UK is very formal, is very contractual, and they prefer a softer approach. Now, that will lend itself to more collaboration, but I think we also need to be aware that collaboration does not mean the same thing for everyone. And of course, in an international context, it might work a bit differently. You've got contractors who may not do that many projects in one country and long term relationships, perhaps are less of an issue. But ultimately, it will depend on the clients, the funders, bodies like World Banks. And they traditionally have tended to put all the risk on contractors and put an emphasis on fixed prices for certainty and have been less open to more collaborative or innovative forms of contract and the use of target cost contracts. And I think there will be an in initial reluctance so to use some of the more sophisticated incentive mechanisms that NEC provides and that we've seen in the UK. But of course, there has to be a recognition that using the traditional method of putting all the risk on the contractor or going for a basic fixed price and form of contracting is not really going to result in genuine collaboration. And as I've said, it has to be client-led, and if it, clients can see the benefits of long-term relationships with trusted parties, I think they can become a lot more open to wider collaboration and get the benefits of that approach. And if we move to the next slide, it brings us to what I think it's really all about, isn't it? Better commercial management, and what everybody wants, which is certainty on time, cost, and quality. And I think we all know that contracts can help with that, but they won't guarantee the outcome and they're only part of the overall picture. But if NEC can show it is better place to deliver more certainty, even if it's not complete certainty, it will be in a good position. There are lots of surveys out there on international construction disputes, and I think that what they show us is that whatever is currently being used is not always delivering that certainty. And this is why people are looking at options and alternatives. And a lot of it is, of course, about better project management. And I think it's interesting to have a bit of a think as to what NEC provides, which will be easy and I think will be adopted internationally fairly quickly. And what will get a bit more of a resistance and requires a bit more understanding. And I think nobody can argue with the benefits of early warnings and better program management. We've seen other forms of contract using the same approach, and I think that's recognized. Open book accounting, full and honest communications, I think can be a challenge in some locations. But when you think about it, many of the concerns from clients, international funders, are about transparency having the comfort that they understand where the money is going and how it is being spent. And if, if that is their concern, then it should be fairly obvious that having 
an open book approach will give them that certainty, will give them that comfort that they understand how their money is being spent and where it is all going. The other thing that I think will challenge internationally is forecast-based assessment. We all know that people sometimes prefer to wait and see, but of course that can lead to more uncertainty. And if it can be understood that fixing the costs as and when they happen provides more certainty and possibly avoids later disputes, then this can be seen as a real benefit and it's not just an administrative burden. And I still find it surprising that some people seem to accept that you will not know whether the project was over or below budget or whether you've made a profit or a loss until say two, three years after completion where the final account dispute is finally decided possibly through arbitration. So moving on to the next slide, it won't be complete if we don't talk about disputes or differences. Now in the UK, adjudication has been very successful because the courts enforce it and therefore it is effective and has real value. Whether, for example, a French court will enforce an adjudicated decision in the same way is a different question. And you can, of course, use arbitration. But I think the real point is that court or arbitration proceedings take a long time, they cost a lot of money, and you still have no certainty of outcome. The reality is they're not truly really a suitable forum for a final account dispute. And of course, in the real world, parties prefer to avoid disputes. And NEC provides some really useful tools in that respect. If you look at things like senior representative discussions, yes, they probably happen anyway, but it's useful to have a hook within the contract and sometimes it makes it easier for parties to start that process. Dispute avoidance boards are more interesting. It's an option that is much more common internationally, but I'm not really surprised that NEC now provides for them to be used in the UK. I think what people are recognizing is that there, there is a real value in having a view from a respected third party and in an environment that is not as hostile as formal dispute resolution. In the UK, we've seen similar things with the LEL care process or the DAPs that Network Rail use. And I think there is a real openness into using this kind of mechanism and trying to avoid traditional dispute resolution methods. So moving on to my conclusions. Well, NEC is certainly much better known and understood now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. And I think what we see is that there is a genuine need for alternatives. When you speak to people internationally, they are looking for options. They are trying to see if things can be done differently. And NEC works very well in that context and provides an innovative, easy to use approach. But if there's one thing we've learned from the UK, in order to get the benefits of NEC, you need to understand how it works. And for that, training and education will be absolutely important. Thank you, Ian. Shai, thank you for that. Uh, very interesting. We've got a couple of minutes for questions before we move on to the next presentation. Uh, I see Richard Patterson has raised a couple of questions. Just picking up on one of those, uh, he's raised an issue about concern that lenders have about accepting forecasts or forecast costs and concern over transparency. And have any thoughts of how we can deal with that? Well, it goes me to my point about education and training and helping them look at some real life projects, some of the case studies we'll cover later. As I said before, NEC actually should provide more transparency and certainty, which is ultimately what lenders want. I think the difficulty is they don't quite understand how that works at the moment. So there is a reluctance. Um, but the reality is um, that other forms of contract don't necessarily give them that certainty. They do end up in disputes. I think if you look and compare the fact that forecasts are built into it, the fact that open book accounting can be used as an option should lend itself to people who want more transparency and more certainty. You almost get that situation that people uh, like that they don't know certain things, that they're just being paid a lump <laughs> sum or they're being charged a lump sum figure don't need to dig in too far behind it. Whereas actually, as you say, actual cost, that visibility should give them greater comfort that the money is being spent appropriately. Well, okay. well yes. I mean, so, so, the, so I'm going to 
I was gonna say, the problem, of course, with fixed price contracts is that there is always a suspicion that perhaps somebody is paying too much or that there isn't an awareness. And people need to recognize that if they want another option, they can. But of course, there's there's a quid pro quo. And if you want more transparency, um, it does require a different approach and possibly different pricing. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got one hand in the air there from Peter Higgins. Peter, would you like to ask a question? Sure. I'm asking about um, the question of interpretations, putting it, putting a translation into a different uh, contract. If you if you make the um, translated contract the formal one, it may not actually reflect what the NEC is meant to do. So there's a problem in there. However, the other route that's been used, I think, is to say that you can have a translation which will help the parties to operate the contract, but the English version will be the ruining one, which then means that the people are operating a contract which may actually not say what the NEC says, um, and they get it all wrong. Now, how do we deal with that in terms of translations? Uh, well, I, I completely agree. It, it, I think that you need to ask, first of all, is a translation absolutely necessary and what is it being used for? If it's used because local law requires every contract to be in the local language and you have no choice, then I think you need to invest in a good translation that will get as close as possible to what NEC tries to achieve. Uh, if it's not a formal requirement and you want to use it simply because it's more practical, then again, I think you, you, you need to think who will be using it and how to ensure that whatever it is you're using is not left by the wayside. And one possible option is not to translate the contract, leave the contract in English, because that ultimately will determine rights and obligations, but use perhaps a manual or translate the guidance notes so that people use those and have the guidance in a local language because that's easier, but don't detract from the importance of the contract and leave that perhaps in English. Thanks, good point. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, thanks for the question, Peter, and the response there, Shai. I know that when we come on to the presentation shortly from Lantis in Antwerp, Belgium, they will touch on the issue of translation and some of the challenges they've had to meet the requirements of local law. If there are further questions for Shai, we can pick them up at the end of all of the presentations when we have a sort of ask the panel session. But just mindful of time, we'll move on now. Um, just a quick slide to uh, talk about. Um, I'll cover this. Just really picking up on what Shia said about the international use of the NEC contracts and that the NEC uses Y clauses to address regional specific legislation. We've had Y clauses in the UK for some time to deal with the requirements of the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act and its successors. We're now also creating Y clauses for different parts of the world. The Y clauses for Australia to be used with NEC4 are going to be released very shortly. They're in the final stages of production in relation to the ECC contracts and the subcontracts with other contracts to follow. And that will pick up security of payment legislation relevant to each state within Australia. And also in the Republic of Ireland, there's some additional Y clauses that are being created there to take into account local legislation with a view to releasing those in the next couple of months. And as the NEC grows internationally, as there is more demand, the NEC will look to create further Y clauses. And when we do create those Y clauses, we do it by using local expertise, local knowledge to make sure that whatever is being produced works from both an NEC perspective, but as importantly, from a local perspective. OK, so moving on on the agenda, then we're now going to have a case study on the Osterweil project in Belgium. And Katrien van Rompuy is going to take us through this particular session. Katrien is Lantis's contract manager for the Osterweil programme. She's a civil engineer with a background in infrastructure project management and international development. Katrien has been working with Lantis since 2018, starting as the contract manager for the Right Bank project, which is part of the overall programme, which Katrien will explain shortly. Um, she's been introducing the NEC into the Belgium infrastructure market since September 2018 coordinating with stakeholders from both the client side and the contractor side, looking to develop a standardised Flemish version of the contract, a Flemish language version of the contract for the engineering and construction contracts, the ECC, the main contract form. 
Uh, Catherine is involved in all parties on all sides to introduce the key concepts of mutual trust and collaboration in the Flemish construction sector, where historically a culture of claims and conflict has been present. And these uh, changes, along with the need to move into a highly complex project for the Osterweil, create certain challenges, which I'm sure she'll explain in some detail for us now. Catherine, over to yes. you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'll uh, talk you through this presentation in three parts, so we can go to the next slide. Um, first of all, I will give you an insight on the project itself, the Austria program. Then I will explain why Lantis has chosen to use the NEC. Um, as Chai explained that sometimes people use the word neck, that's really completely the, the, the thing in Belgium. We say neck, we don't say NEC, so if I use that word, it's still the same. And uh, the last part of my presentation is about how we integrated the NEC contract in the Belgium uh, or for the Austerail program in the Belgian sector. So the first part, if you can go, yeah, um, we're going to have a, a mobility infrastructure project in the Antwerp city that is going to have a huge impact. And we're going to try to have a both mobility and livability going hand in hand. So in the next slide, again, there is the Antwerp Ring Road, which you can see it's um, quite in the middle of the trans-European network. There's three out of nine of the trans-European network corridors passing by Antwerp. There is a port of Antwerp, which is a main economic junction for uh, Belgium, for Flanders, but also for the Western of Europe. And we have up to 140,000 vehicles and even more passing by on the Ring of Antwerp. So the Ring of Antwerp, um, yes, next. <laughs> It's, um, as you can see, it's only partially uh, completed. So we have an incomplete ring road. There's no crossing in the north of Antwerp. And the ring road itself goes through the viaduct through dense neighborhoods. Um, on the next picture, you will see the viaduct itself. So this viaduct, this picture seems to be quite clear out of the city, but it's actually within the city center. And it doesn't make really the city livable on that side of the city. So what we're going to do um, if you can see in the next picture again, we can see there's uh, what we call with the Austerail project, it's the great connection. So we're going to start connecting the ring itself, making it complete, as you see at number one. Um, we're going to have a scaled crossing and linking the left bank ring road with the right bank ring road. And there's also the part where the, where the viaduct is in, the, we're going to demolish the viaduct and have the ring road under the under the ground level. On, on top of that, we're going to increase livability by having a lot of more open spaces. Uh, and that's also the reason why we call it the Great Connection, because we also want to connect the city parts that are now um, split by the viaduct. So we have indeed, we have five projects itself. Uh, the left bank project is already going on with a classic contract. And then we have four of them going into the market or it's already into the market with an NEC contract. The first one is a scale tunnel, a Osterville Junction, Junction, the canal tunnels and the Air One North. Two and three are separate contracts, four and five is one contract. And then we have the scale tunnel and that's this one on the next picture. You will see it's a, the, a big tunnel with two times three lanes. Um, it's the next picture already. <laughs> And they're going to build the, the blocks of the tunnel in Zeebrugge and bring them over the Skeld itself towards uh, the place where it should be in order to have this tunnel crossing the Skeld itself. The next one is the Osterweil Junction. And there is a picture showing you that the Osterweil Junction will be the complex um, to link the part of the port of Antwerp with both the left bank and the right bank. So if you see in the next picture, the, the junction itself will be under the ground level and there's place or there's space left for creating open space in order to have this liveability in the city increased in the north of Antwerp. Next are the canal tunnels. And then again, we have a, a picture trying to show you the tunnels, but as they are underground, it's going to be um, less obviously, but the tunnels are under the canal. Uh, it's the black line that's on the picture. The tunnels are connecting the Osterweil junction with the ring one, the ring in the north of Antwerp. And the last part of it is the Air One North. It's the demolishment of the viaduct. And in the last picture of this presentation, of, of this part of the presentation, 
This is where the, the viaduct was that I saw in the picture before. So we're going to demolish the viaduct and we're going to bring the ring road under the ground level and we're going to increase the open spaces in the city by covering the tunnels or by covering the, the ring on several places. The second part of my presentation, I will talk you through why we have actually chosen NEC contracts. So the characteristics of our projects were, um, we have four, three projects, they're going to go for a long term. Um, some of them are starting next year, other ones will start in 2022, but it will take up to 10 years before we have finished the project. So we need flexible contracts. Um, our design is still going on. It's not finished yet, so we expect changes while going for execution. There's a big technical complexity of this project. For example, we have an old dock in the in the Albert Canal that we need to demolish in order to, to construct a tunnel. It's, of course, embedded in the city centre of Antwerp, which also means that there's a difficulty of... Um, making sure that the project goes close with the uh, constructing of the project goes close with the, the, the livelihood or the neighborhoods of the city itself. And we have a strict budget as well, so we need the contractors to be involved for the value in engineering. I also have a quote of one of our contractors saying that um, this kind of project with such a complexity needs actually a contract that's transparent and, and trust in, that put transparency and trust in the middle. Um, so hoping that NEC will do that. Next, we found we asked ourselves what kind of client we want to be as Lantis. Um, we said we have an alliance of the future with stakeholders on the side of the city and with uh, citizen organizations. And it's the same kind of alliance that we would like to create with our contractors. We said, of course, that we want to be proactive and solution oriented because with the strict time and budget, we can't afford um, ending up with claims and conflicts. And we want to be a fair, professional and reasonable client. Therefore, we needed a contract that was having best for project mentality and would give us a, a balanced distrib distribution of risk and responsibilities. And also, we needed really a contract that enhances collaboration between parties instead of actually driving for conflicts and claims. So knowing all these, the characteristics of the project, uh, the vision that we had, that the kind of client we would like to be or that we want to be, um, the drivers to choose NEC were for us the, the open book accounting gives us the transparency and it's going to give us the, the foundation to build the trust, which is on the next slide. So we have also, uh, we have been looking for mechanisms to, as proactivity. We know already things in Belgian um, sector, in the Belgian construction sector, we know already things less, such as early warnings, but the way it is embedded in the NEC contract is really new to us. We've been looking for aspects to, to, to align the objectives, such as the pain and the gain. Um, the cash flow is also one of the, e the the reasons why we've chosen NEC. And we also have experience now on the left bank. As I said, the contract is already going, is already executed with the contractors now, or it's going on. Uh, it's a typical lump sum, as Shai mentioned as well. It's a typical lump sum. Risks are with the contractor. And we have now already the experience that these kind of contracts that we are used to, it's not working for these kind of complex projects. And again, as I mentioned, the, the time and budgets are quite strict, so we can't afford to, to have standstills on the site due to conflicts. So we need the continuity and we were really looking for an operational contract. And of course, the, the thing with NEC is that there's already 30 years of uh, being tested and approved. There are, for us in the Belgian sector, a lot of new mechanisms in NSE, and I just highlight a few of them. There is, of course, the target cost and having the pain and gain share, um, really new concept to us. The financial department at Elantis is really preparing um, for the diff to, to, to figure out how to define cost and disallowed costs, how to deal with it, how to assure cost assurance, how to assure cost controlling. So it really needs an effort from our side as the client as well. Um, having an accepted program continuously in order to evaluate compensation events also. It's not that we didn't work with programs or plannings, but this kind of method, it's also new for us. And especially, I think one of the main major changes is the, the role of the project, man, project manager. Um, the Belgian 
general execution rules that those are like an NEC contract, but then for the Belgian general execution rules, they don't have a project manager in that sense. Um, it's always the project, the client against the contractor. So the role of the project manager is also one of the things that we as a client really need to look at it, like how are we going to set up this? How are we going to deal with it? How are we going to keep this person in a neutral uh, role? And another quote from one of our contractors is that um, they said there's a, a lot of contracts already with meaningless phrases on collaboration, but this NEC contract, it really pushes us. It forces us as parties to collaborate. So finally, we will can we can put our energy in creating together. So the third part is about how did we actually started integrating the NEC contract in the Belgian context? How did we adopt it in our context, in our local laws? Um, we had to do the translation due to a Belgian law. Um, and then there's the phase of translation, interpretation, aligning and implementation. In order to do so, we had five general principles that we set uh, in front of our work when we started. We said we wanted a blueprint translation, not just for the Osterwil program or for the right bank projects, but a blueprint that we can use for further projects as well for Lantis. We also had a quite of a discussion. Are we going to use actually the general execution laws rules from Belgium or are we going to use the NEC? It needs to end up somewhere in the middle. We decided actually to stay as close as possible to NEC as this is really an operational contract where the general execution rules are more lawyers language. We also decided that we needed to involve the contractors right from the start from when we started translating, even when we started thinking about changing the contract. Um, and we need to avoid, that's one of the things, we need to avoid different interpretations because when translating, there's also the possibility of having different interpretations of the, the clauses. And also, um, while Shai suggested to translate the manual, yeah, so we have to translate the contract itself by law. We also um, said now the idea of translating the manual using the the one that's there, um, but having our own Flemish manual in order to have one that matches our contract perfectly. So we had an organizational setup in, in order to have this translation. We started internally with our, our a small group at the client side, mainly contract managers. The next layer in this group of translating was involving the contractors, but mostly the operational people, so also contract managers from the contractor side. And the third layer was the lawyers to keep the... So actually we had a lot of um, advice like keep the lawyers out. So we kept them in the outer circle. On timeline, um, we started in September 2018 thinking of, of changing the contract. The first translation of NEC was in May 2019. That was a translation that has been done by the the translation office of our lawyer's office and we started discussing since then. So we are already for a full year having intense discussions with the contractors, um, sometimes up to two full days a, a week where we're sitting together, uh, two, three people, four people, a small group like what's this clause mean? Did we translate it correctly? Is it the same interpretation in Dutch? Is there a double interpretation possible? We had uh, a joint NEC courses project management uh, accreditations together with the client and contractor people. We had our first um, translation for review in December, which has been reviewed by both client and contractor side. And since January, we're having again discussions, but also now with the lawyers involved. So the third layer has been involved. And we hope to finalize or we will finalize actually the final translation by next week. Now, about the struggles we had with the translation, I think the language, as everybody already noticed, the language is really important. The use of words is actually key. And I think afterwards, one of the mistakes we had is that we first translated and only then started following the courses. One of the things we bumped into was, for example, our first translator, he translated the the idea of notification in 10 different things. So sometimes it was translated as notification. The next time it was like, he will tell you or he will give a sign. And only by following the course, we realized that notification should always be notification. Our next question was like, is notification the same as to notify? So we started figuring out like, is there a difference on that side? 
And then there's also very important to have the knowledge of concepts because you only know that that notification and to notify should be the same if you have the knowledge of these concepts. The translation, the first translation, of course, was by the lawyer's uh, translation office. So I had to change again to kick out the, the, the lawyer's language and make it again a more operational language. And then we had the discussion sometimes about interpretation versus literally translation. For example, we had activity schedule and we translated it literally. And then by discussing and by involving experts on that side, we realized that there was already a word in Dutch, which was not the literal translation, but was exactly the same concept. So we had to use a different word. And then also the lack of cross-references is something that we're really not used to. Our classic contracts are full of cross-references um, and this one isn't. So sometimes you bump up and there's a clause and it's exactly the same expression than in another clause, but it, it got us at the end, uh, it's, I think especially in February and March, we got completely paranoia and we start looking for each word like, you have this word here, is it somewhere else? Is it the same expression? Is it the same mention? But I think it's been a good example or being a good exercise that we did together with the uh, with the contractors um, it might have taken us a bit too far sometimes but i think it's better to go a bit too far and coming back instead of not going far enough so when did we brought in the lawyers that was for the moment that we need to align with the local law so um, belgian law is embedded in civil law and the uk is the common law um, that mostly had an impact on the dispute clause, uh, dispute resolution clause. So we developed for ourselves a new uh, W4, um, which is more or better embedded in the way that um, the, the dispute resolution has been um, organized in Belgium. As I mentioned already before, there's a general execution rules in Belgium, which is very lawyer's language and very on, if you don't do that, you will be punished by this. If you don't do that, you will be, um, have a damage over there, delay damage, or it's very um, conflict and claims oriented. Um, but there are still some parts that are working and well known, and there are also parts that are legally obliged to follow. So one of the things that we had to change was the uh, uh, the concept of completion. We had to change it. We changed it to preliminary delivery, which is more known in Belgium and easier for us to adopt. Um, also, the, the prices for the work done to date, um, we had to make sure that it doesn't conflict with our pre-financing limitations in the Belgian law. So this part is really where we had to involve the lawyers and where we had also extended discussions with lawyers from both sides, contractors and clients. Our last part is, of course, when you have the translation and the correct transparency, the correct interpretation of the contract, that there's a need to implement it in the organization. The, the implementation at Lantis itself, we said to in order to implement this NEC contract, we need a new mindset with our people to for collaboration, but there's also new organization. Um, cost assurance, our financial department is really working hard to have a restructuring in order to accept or to be able to go for the cost controlling and cost uh, assurance part with the target cost contract. We're also looking towards our project teams, like how we're going to get this project manager role, um, trying to split the project teams, like the project team on the client side and having a project team on the project manager side. The last three months from April to June this year, we have the task force within the organization. We have about 40% of Lantis people working about 60% for their time on this uh, task force. And this task force is really meant to embed the NEC contract into the organization. We are actually working on strategies, on processes, on tools in order to make this this process or uh, this contract working in the organization and to make people understand that we need a, a different mindset. So we're working towards a common understanding within the organization and also to create this mindset of mutual trust between parties. And not only the organization itself, we're also um, hoping that the contractors on their side are starting the implementation um, on the collaborative side of implementation. As I said, we had a really uh, intense um, discussion, process of discussion on the contract itself. So we're really working towards this common understanding of NEC. And we are also appointing uh, quite soon a collaboration coach, as we are really not used to having this kind of collaboration and the Belgian 
construction sector is really um, well known for claims and conflicts. We're going to appoint a collaboration coach in order to have also this mindset of collaboration on all the levels of the organization. And as I mentioned, we have the task force within our organization. We're also involving the contractors in this task force in order to, 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 to discuss the processes that we, that we are elaborating. And the last quote is from the Lantis side. Um, we have this contract with NEC and it offers us a high degree of predictability. Um, we want our partners to know what they can expect from us as a client and we want them to know what we expect from them. And that's the reason why we really involve them on such a high level. And that's it. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you, Catherine, for that very uh, detailed presentation there, given the background to the journey you've been on with the NEC. Obviously, a lot of challenges that you've been through around the translation, etc. But uh, certainly can see it making progress. Um, there's uh, limited time for questions. I'll just pick out a couple of quick questions, then move on to the next presentation. But as I mentioned earlier, there will be time for more questions later. Uh, Ross Hayes has asked, is the translation going to be available to other clients or contractors in Belgium and Antwerp? Or is that just going to be internal to Lantis? Is there any plans around that? Well, we we always had the, the, the idea of having a blueprint for the whole construction sector in Belgium. So it's going to be useful for all Belgium, but uh, other clients, they will need to get their own uh, rights with NEC, of course. So we have a, a copyright, but only for Lantis projects. But we said that we will willing to share our translation for other projects and clients. Okay, that's very positive. Uh, and then just one final question then. Uh, it's, it's a very good question, actually, and I think I know the answer, but... <laughs> By going through the translation process, did that find you, you know, gain a much better understanding of how the contract should operate, having to look at those notifications, the different phrases, and really understand what they meant in application to then translate them into, into Flemish? Well, I think that's a bit what I said uh, during the, the presentation itself, like each word needs to be up, turned upside down in order to make sure that you translated it in the right way, that you interpret it in the right way, and that everybody has the same mindset. What what does this mean? What does this clause mean? Um, so it's been a really, really intense uh, process together with the contractors. We were actually four people, um, two on the contractor side and uh, two on Lanti side. Um, so a hard job to do. Don't don't do it if you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, requirements of local law I mean that's a necessity. OK, thank yeah. you very much for that presentation. Uh, we'll now move on and have a further presentation and some questions at the end. So we've now got a presentation around work at Hong Kong Airport on their third runway project. And this is contract 3801, one of the first NEC contracts or possibly the first NEC contract the airport authority has undertaken. And it involves... Uh, construction of the APM and BHS tunnels, um, which are part of, say, of the third runway project. We're going to have a short uh, video and then we're going to have a Q&A session. And for the Q&A session, we're going to be joined by Daryl Kingan, who is the deputy director of the third runway construction at the airport authority in Hong Kong. Daryl is a chartered civil engineer with more than 30 years of experience in project management for large multidisciplinary infrastructure projects in both the UK and Hong Kong, including the original airport construction and also the boundary crossing project that's recently been constructed in Hong Kong and is now overseeing the AA's third runway divisions project delivery office. And Daryl will be joined by Mr. Victor Wu, who's Deputy General Manager of China State Construction Engineering Limited, who are the contractor on the project. Victor's a chartered engineer with more than 38 years of experience in project management for large multidisciplinary infrastructure projects, both in Hong Kong and mainland China. Mr. Wu has joined China State in 2010, responsible for more than 10 major infrastructure projects, many of which have been at the airport. The Victor truly trusts that collaboration between the employer and contractor will be the best approach to deliver the project. And as I say, after this short presentation, you'll have a chance to ask them questions around their experience and use of NEC. So please use the chat function to Put them any questions you'd like to raise. Cheryl.
the Augmented Collaborative Safety Culture, or ACSC, program at AAHK 3801 is an innovative and scientifically driven health and safety program to improve overall safety performance through effective collaboration, leadership, and a safety culture at the site. <laughs> The ACSC program may be different than what the workers are used to, so we engage with them to introduce and explain it as part of their initial safety induction training. This includes the Health and Safety Climate Questionnaire, or HSCQ, subcontractor training, and workshops for all management level personnel. Our program goal is consistent with the NEC value of trust and collaboration and the airport authority's vision of a happy workplace. Workshops under the ACSC and Behavioral Engagement and Observation, or BINO, programs have three goals, to acknowledge individual differences, to develop effective communication, and to learn the rules of engagement for effective communication with coworkers. The BINO program builds an environment where management engage with workers to discuss safety and their experience at the site. Here's a short example of such engagement. Observers bridge between frontline staff and senior management through awareness, empathy, effective listening, and respect to build trust with the workers by using positive psychology. Meetings are held with different stakeholders every Friday to address worker feedback. The meetings are attended by a diverse, psychologically aware team that create a platform for anyone to express their concerns without fear of retribution. Here are some photos of the action and follow-up done at the management level. In addition to the BINO program, the senior managers also communicate directly with workers through video to express their concerns, particularly citing highlighted risk factors to the workers. Thank you again for all your hard work. Please keep it up. We've got a lot of work to be done coming up in, uh, in the next 18 months, two years. And uh, please look after yourselves on the site. Our program is data driven and uses our HSCQ to measure the weekly site safety climate. Workers and management can access the questionnaire through QR codes at the site. After data analyses, weekly posters are made for easy interpretation of the safety climate, while we also prepare monthly charts. The HSCQ cumulative score provides a predictive value of the monthly safety trends and more. ACSC是地盤的一個新的安全的文化 the essence of the program is to use a positive psychology towards safety that will deliver results that can be measured while at the same time create a happy workplace.
By building trust between workers and management, we create a site with a safety culture where people are able to express issues and concerns. Engagement and collaboration between workers and management creates a more harmonious workplace where all matters can be discussed to create a better safety culture. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Hopefully that was of interest. I think now Daryl and Victor are going to join us for the Q&A session. Yes, hello yes. Ian. Hi, Daryl. How are you doing? Hi, Victor. Um, yeah, yeah, so good. if people would like to start asking any questions, then they can put them into the chat function. Um, if Perhaps if I could start with a, a first question. I'm just interested to understand, obviously, that presentation very much around health and safety, the cultures being embedded there. Did you think the use of the NEC target cost contracts helped make that happen? Where it was tried any, any benefits in that regard? Yeah, I think it has. Uh, I, the... Victor used this uh, safety culture scheme on a project previously, four or five years ago, and it's got. A, I won't say who the client was, but the the, the uh, basically it was paid by the contractor. Uh, we, the AA, have basically paid for this uh, yeah. under the NEC uh, because we're we're obviously driving safety. Uh, safety is a massive issue, obviously, around on construction around the world. Uh, in, in Hong Kong, safety is improving, but it's still got a long way to go. From the airport, original airport construction and the other 10 mega projects 20 odd years ago, safety certainly improved and it's massively improved since then, but we're still having too many fatalities, too many accidents on our sites. And and, and Victor put this forward and uh, we discussed it and, and basically we we agreed to pay for it. And, and we're very happy with the uh, the safety culture on the site. We have a clinical psychologist, which is quite unusual for uh, engineers, etc., to be involved with psychologists and so on, and, and the construction workers. Uh, but it's brought a lot of positive uh, awareness to the site and an improvement on safety. And we've got a very good safety record uh, to date. Yeah. Yep. I'd like to share that. Is uh, in fact. NEC um, uh, emphasizing on collaboration based on trust. I think uh, this particular safety uh, program is really uh, based on that particular uh, element. In fact, the Dr. Lee uh, been, been putting a lot of the, the activities, the observation, we will create a very uh, psychological safe environment. And then I think the workers, uh, the subcontractor, they are, they are actually is uh, willing to talk about what they feel, and then every Friday I sit in the, the meeting uh, with them. I hear, and then I find out what solution um, may not be all necessary safety. Some of them relate to the progress. I think with this NEC um, 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 spirit and the principle, I think uh, uh, the program itself uh, is uh, it proved to be uh, very successful. Don't forget the cameras. Yeah. Thank you. OK, uh, no, Catherine, you want to join the conversation now, maybe have a conversation amongst all of the people in the previous presentations. Um, another question, though, through to the team in Hong Kong. In terms of language, um, the contract you're using there is the English language version of the NEC. There's no need to translate it for the requirements of local law. But obviously on the video, lots of the signs, lots of the day to day communication is going to be um, in, in the local language in Cantonese. Has that posed an issue? How do you have that juxtaposition between an English language contract and then lots of communications in Cantonese? Well, I think for Hong Kong construction, that's been the norm for so many years now. And and uh, I think uh, in terms of that, obviously, I've got a team that are, are mainly Hong Kong Chinese. I've, I've got a couple of other expats, all, all uh, Victor's team are all uh, Hong Kong Chinese, but basically they, they, we don't really have a significant issue with language. It, it's I, I don't personally know Cantonese, although I can, because Cantonese, when they talk, they always slip English words in. I always <laughs> seem to know what they're talking about, which they are quite we, surprised about. But, uh, but uh, to me, there's no big issue with language. Well, I, I think it's the, actually it's the, um, and it's using a very simple um, sort of the, um, uh, language, uh, easy to understand. 
In fact, when the application of the NEC principle in our daily activity, uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. And uh, the people actually are emphasizing uh, about the program, the safety program to the workers, uh, to the foreman. I think they, they all easy understand it and actually they feel uh, they, they feel very safe. And then uh, they know we respect them. And because of the respect, of the respect they, they all feel that is a, a great program and that, that is really good. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know, Catherine, from your perspective, obviously you have to go through the process of translation um, to, to mix it. I guess there was no choice. You had to translate the contract? Yeah, the the local law says that as we are working for the Flemish government, although Lantis is a separate organization, we're still working for the Flemish government and then it needs to be in Dutch. can be in other languages as well, but it needs to be at least in Dutch or Flemish, that, which is kind of Dutch. <laughs> um, uh, we're looking for any other questions coming. If you do have any questions, please do ask them. Uh, there's one here from Jeremy Dixon around um, an international contract as a reading language, then local translation is commonplace to make it work on the ground. Mm -hmm. Having a guidance document in the local language could cause some potential confusion. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we, the NEC is designed to be used on an international basis. Um, say the idea of simple language to make it easy and accessible to those people whose language first language isn't english uh, which obviously the hong kong example there which using it in the original published version with some local amendments but we do get the situation in different countries where there is a need to translate it into a particular language and that's really where i think the difficulties uh, come in understanding not just you know i, I think you know Katrina, it was you could do a google translate and they could replace one word in English with a word in, in Flemish. But then if you string the words together, does it make a sentence? Does it make sense? Does it convey the same meaning? And that's really where the challenge has been in that translation process. Yeah, and I think if you, you've been involved in the process as well, how many questions did we they ask about, is this right? If we interpret it like this, if we translate it in this way, it gives a different interpretation. We also struggled sometimes with uh, the places where parts of the sentences were, because if you translate it literally in Dutch and you keep the places of the sentences, then the sentence keep, gets a different meaning. Um, so it's always almost clause by clause that we had to check, like, is this how it's meant in English? And is then the, the Dutch translation the, the right translation? So it's on the level of words itself, but it's also on the level of, of sentences and clauses. How they fit together. Uh, a question has come in there from Richard Patterson uh, for Hong Kong, which is around subcontracts and a question whether any of these subcontracts subcontracts have been translated into Cantonese. Um, are you using Cantonese versions of NEC contracts or are you using almost like domestic versions of your own contract already in Cantonese? Uh, OK, uh, for the, our company, um, China State, uh, we have our own um, uh, domestic subcontract, uh, and that subcontract has been um, sort of approved by the client, Apple Authority, and uh, we we don't have this uh, uh, NEC subcontract uh, well, translation. One. No, but well, we're, sorry, we have but one. But we have we're, one. We're using one NEC. Yeah, the English one. Yeah, <laughs> one NEC subcontract in English, which is and and one of the main reasons the AA wanted to go to towards using the NEC option D for this. Uh, project was because of the works that go underneath the MTRC uh, that goes from uh, the airport railway from Terminal 1 round to the Asia World Expo, the expo on the airport. And, and basically that is uh, an NEC subcontract because that involves tunneling under the MT M MTRC and then we're going to be jacking tunnel the tunnel boxes underneath the, MR uh, the uh, MTC. Right. Yeah. And basically we decided between us that we thought that would be a good subcontract for the to use the NEC, but it's in English, and uh, and that that subcontract's working very well because that's the most difficult work we've got to do uh, on, on this project. Okay, uh, and from Hong, uh, from sorry, from an Antwerp perspective, uh, Catherine, are the contractors there intending to use subcontract versions of the translated contract you're creating for their subcontracts? Has that been discussed at all? It has been discussed. That they have taken a look at it, um, but the the intense process of translating the engineering and construction contract has been quite um, heavy, or to say so. So 
um, the idea is there, but it doesn't start yet because everybody is like, let's finish this one first and then we'll see if we can do something else. But we need to set up this one first. And the ideas, yeah, the ideas might be there. Um, having subcontracting, uh, having translated to NEC subcontracting contracts, but not yet. So we will start without these kind of contracts. Thank you. Uh, Shai, from your perspective, do you get many calls from contractors or clients asking for translations or looking for you to assist in translations of the contracts? Um, we get it sometimes, but it's, it, it is quite rare. And I think Catherine has done a really good job at explaining why it is so difficult to translate a contract properly and why there's a real risk that whatever you translate, as much care as you put, will not give you what the original tries to achieve. Um, and if you have to, you have to, but it, it gives real problem. It's really difficult to translate the contract properly. And as Catherine said, if you can avoid it, try to think about how you, you, you avoid it. But it, again, just to remember, even, the, even if you use the English version, you know, your choice of governing law will also make a big difference as to how the contract operates. Um, you know, clause 10.1 or 10.2, mutual trust and cooperation. We all know under English law that's a big issue, but under civil law systems, that may well be very straightforward and easy to understand. So that there's, uh, that there's a few things about language, but people should not get fixated just about the language. There's also what governing law you're using. That will also affect how the contract works in practice. If I if I can add to that, I I know I said that try to avoid it if you have to, but for example, in I I would do it again even if I don't have to in the sense that Dutch is still or Flemish is still the language well known by everybody here, and the English is is might might be a barrier. So I would suggest it again in in our local context of of Flemish being the primary language. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here, I think for the Hong Kong team. Um, in terms of Z clauses, the Hong Kong government produces quite a long list of uh, suggested Z clauses for Hong Kong government contracts. Uh, what was the approach with the airport authority? Did they take those on board en masse or take a different view? Uh, 3801 is, our, as you know, in our first contract, NEC contract, and now we've got three. But no, we took a slightly different view. We've got as little Z clauses as possible and Y clauses. We, we, we don't want another mass of Z clauses that is basically means it's as long as the, the contract itself. Uh, I've worked on one government contract with their special conditions of contract. So now we took the decision, very few Z clauses and, uh, and it's working very well. And, and obviously the, the other thing that we did was that we decided to, uh, to go straight to option D, target cost open book, which is not commonly used in Hong Kong. It has been used, uh, but we are very happy that we've gone down that route as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, Catherine, obviously you're using option C, I believe, for your project. So again, a move not just to a new form of contract, but also a new payment regime around that. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier, again, your approach to Z clauses or amending the standard was to try to do that as little as possible. Yeah, we're trying to um, just keep the Z clauses uh, in order to make sure the few Z clauses that we're going to have about indeed the cost assurance because the open book accounting is a bit of a struggle to set it straight between parties. And then there's going to be the Z clauses that are really necessary due to general execution rules. Um, so that's the main part of Z clauses that we're going to have, but we're going limit to them, limit them as much as possible. And would I be right in saying the way you're going to do that is actually have them as Z clauses to say, you know, here's almost a translated standard and then these are changes or will they be within the, the words of the actual contract you create? Well, the, the clauses of the NEC contract there where we need to change it, we changed it. So we used the asterisks in order to identify the clauses that we had changed uh, uh, compared with the English, uh, the standard contract. So it's quite obviously for the Dutch readers or the Flemish readers where the changes are between the English one and the Dutch one. 
And then we have the Z clauses of other things that really uh, need to go in there and are not linked to different or other Z or the clauses, the standard clauses that are in the contract. So we made a difference like there's the, the still the, con the clauses that are exactly the same. And then we have the ones with the asterisks that are changed in order to adapt to the local law. And then we have some Z clauses. OK, so hopefully clear. So who knows the English translation can see the differences and how that's evolved. Yeah. Okay. And we kept uh, and might... the same numbering as well as things like that. So we didn't change the the, the structure of right. the contract. We kept it exactly okay. the same. So you still had the, the main option, the secondary options, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. But we only translated right. the option C for now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think there's and the X clauses also, yeah. Right, the relevant tech clause you're going to be using. Okay, yeah. uh, so just mindful of time, and we're trying uh, a little bit over time, but hopefully people are finding the discussion interesting. So we'll give ourselves another five minutes before we close out, if that's okay with the speakers. Yeah, Ian, can I just add something else about the, our use of option D and, and so on? Because certainly, certainly uh, as I said in the NEC conference in Hong Kong last year, there's one of the very positive things we see is obviously the, ca uh, the cash flow of the contractor. Uh, Unfortunately, on our other contracts and other contracts in Hong Kong, there are occasions where because of the, the payment regimes and the sub sub contracting, etc. There are problems with subcontractors on site we, we've had no, no problems whatsoever on 3801. Uh, we we're doing the, our contractor does the forecast. We agreed to do it eight weeks ahead. I think we started in, in six weeks. I think yeah. we changed it to yeah. eight. And option D has allowed very much a positive cash flow throughout. And it's something I ask Victor every time we meet, every couple of, uh, every month or whatever, every is, two weeks, is yeah. how's the cash flow? Because basically it, it really is positive for the subcontractors, especially in Hong Kong. And, and obviously, especially with the problems with COVID-19, et cetera. Cash is, is very important for the, the Victor, but it's very important for his subcontractors. Yeah. That's great and that's positive. Yeah, cash is king as we know in the construction industry. So it's great to see that option is allowing that cash to not only get to the first tier, but through the, the other tiers yeah. of the supply chain. Yeah. Uh, another qu another question has come in from Sanjay. A uh, question for Katrine uh, and team about did the, the team approach for translating the NEC help? The idea, I guess, of getting the contractors on board plus other experts, etc. Well, we started off actually with uh, a workshop with, um, internally with uh, the consultant, <laughs> Ian Heafy himself. So we started <laughs> off with that, that way um, and that's how we got involved in NEC. That's how we got to get to know NEC. So they were there from the start, even before the first translation. We had visits to London as well um, to visit clients and, and contractors and people of NEC even before we had to go to have the first translation so yeah we were closely involved and in contact with each other and just pick up an idea of knowledge share and maybe for everyone on the panel to, to share some views on this i know that uh with the work in antwerp there was a lot of knowledge sharing there was visits to the uk they were speaking to other people to try and get some some understanding of how other people are using it and successes or, or issues with the adoption of nec um, I think with the airport, there was some similar conversation. I don't know how extensive, but uh, maybe just starting with you, Catherine, how useful did you find those knowledge share um, events? Well, we actually quite found them quite useful in that way that we're now having next week a first um, kind of uh, workshop. So we're having contact with Environment Agency in the UK, with Thames Tideway. Uh, both on the contract side um, and we are setting up like question and answer sessions for the people from our side with the people from their side because it's so important to have our people as well so not just the five people that went to London to visit projects but the people from Lantis themselves to have this this common understanding but to see that it works when you see people on the side of, of uh, working already with NEC contracts. So I think it's very important and I hope it, it will continue um, that we can have these sharing moments because I think we're still going to run into a lot of questions once we start executing with these contracts. Uh, and Daryl, did the AA take a similar approach at the start? Was there conversations with other clients? I don't know, MTR or others, similar organizations in Hong Kong? Uh, uh, it's a bit hard for me to answer actually because when we tendered free AA one I wasn't actually with the AA I, I joined around the time of just after the award 
but for instance, the MTR, they've got their own target cost contracts, but they, apart from once when they use the NEC on one small project, they've not used the NEC since. Although yesterday they've just awarded the first consultancy uh, in Hong Kong on, on NEC for the new extension in Tung Chung. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like the MTR scene now are probably going towards uh, uh, using NEC. But I'm sure, you know, Kevin, the executive director, my boss, had, and the team had discussions with Hong Kong government and highways, DSD, and maybe uh, also we have close uh, discussions with the Fed runway team in, in London. So I'm sure there was uh, discussions in regard to the NEC. Yeah, I think there was some element of knowledge sharing out the start. I know part of the original procurement strategy there was looking at different, uh, some benchmarking around different uh, airport projects around the world and how they were undertaken. Yeah. Uh, and also speaking with the supply chain to get their views as well. Yeah. And I think in terms of the supply chain, I think the, the Hong Kong contractors very much do like uh, the use of NEC. Mm -hmm. I think they, they, they do prefer option D. Yeah, uh, Victor. Well, Victor can <laughs> confirm that. But, but because in terms of, I've heard comments about A and B in terms of cash flow. In terms of C, I think C is probably better than A and B for the contractors. But obviously, D is the one which I think contractors prefer, and and it's it's totally open book. Yeah. So all the costs, all the subcontracting, we, we see and we're involved in all the subcontracting, and obviously we benefit from the experience of the contractor and how he uh, procures items, let's say, in terms of concrete and, and rebar, especially for a, a company like China State, who do massive orders on a yearly basis with the rebar companies and the concrete companies. And I think it's so much better that we see the, in the open book compared to some of our lump sum contracts, where if we do have problems, obviously, we, we can't see what was spent. It's very hard, and that causes problems. And, and, uh, you know, we're very, the procurement, I've got to say, one thing we did learn on 3801 is getting the procurement going quickly, and it does take time. And that's something we learned, and it was a bit slower on 3801. It's quickened up on our follow-on contracts, and uh, because the procurement can take time, and I think that may be an issue on some of the contracts in Hong Kong, but we, we, we got, you know, you got to work with the contractor to get the subcontracts out and get them agree quickly and, and, and move on and sign them. Well, I, what I'd like to 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 say is that we are we are really so happy and so lucky to have AA uh, as an <laughs> employer. The, the reason no, the reason I say that is that every two weeks, Daryl and his representative and uh, some of our senior project staff sit together and talk about every issues. And then from that, we, we, we pass all this sort of the cooperation and, and trust to the different level. And through these people, uh, we create a, a, a team together. And, and, and in fact, it's, uh, uh, we don't have, um, we have quite direct sort of the discussion. And so very easily, any problem uh, can spot on and then uh, find it. We have a solution uh, that can be uh, found and then we solve it. And then it, it gives us the, uh, some more time and cause assurance for the project, that's the way I see it. Hmm. And it's, I've got to say, I, I obviously have monthly meetings with all the contractors, normally managing director level, et cetera. And the, the discussions I have on the NEC contract that we have is, is the most positive. It, it's, it's the team are working together continually to be looking at, and we're looking at value engineering, how we, think, how we can do things better, et cetera. And we've done some very good value engineering. But it's it's the uh, the team working together, and it, and it's not a negative meeting. Yeah. Under some of our other other main contracts, uh, it's it's very different. I've got to say that, and and uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm on here on this discussion. It's 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 three eight zero one is one of my better contracts <laughs> uh, because it's uh, I have less problems. I've got someone, uh, two people who are my delegates, and and to be honest, most of the time. I'm spent sorting out problems on my other contracts rather than sorting out contracts on problems on this one. So happy. it's a very positive collaboration between ourselves and, and yeah, China. It's a happy project.
Okay, well, that's very great. That's very positive news and, and good to hear. And hopefully, uh, gives Catherine some comfort around the selection of NEC and its use on the Antwerp project going forward. And similar success story there. Um, again, just mindful of time. I've got one final question, then we'll close out, which was um, I think this is for anyone on the panel to, to respond to. Did anyone come across any issues between language used in the contract and language used in other parts of the contract documentation? So, specifications, et cetera. You know, where you have terms like um, yeah, scope in one document, you have um, project manager, maybe engineer being used, acceptance, approvals and different terminology. Did that cause a challenge? Maybe start with Catherine. Yeah, we did indeed had um, changed some of our uh, the words that we use in scope in other documents. Um, we had to adjust it to to NEC, and also because we don't only have the NEC contracts, we also have still the classic Belgian contracts. So we had a list. We we put together a list of definitions of of concepts and and words like this is the one that is being used there. So it's going to be for all contracts now. It's going to have the same. Uh, meaning. Um, so we had to adjust so a lot of documents. Um, we're used to writing in our scope documents, like if you don't do this, you will get a, a penalty. Um, all these things need to go out as well, because it's all in the contract now. It's not more anymore in the scope documents. And the last part that we did was changing the, the structure of the scope. So we have a, a scope structure that we are used to, and we also adapted it to match with the scope of the NEC contracts in order to match with the contract as well. So we have actually now two standards, but the concepts or the words do match with each other. Okay, thank you. And, and Daryl from Hong Kong, perspective or Victor? No, I don't think we've had any major issues. Certainly again in the past, obviously on other contracts I've worked on, there has always been certain contractors who pick up those things and, and want to use those, but we, we've not had any scope issues or specification issues and, and whatever. And and if there are, then we, you know, any issues, you know, we've, we've got the early warnings, we've got the compensation events, and, and we, we get through them and, and move on. Yeah. And I think you think I'm right saying that as well, in your documentation, you have a sort of a bit of a key or again, a glossary of certain terms in your standard particular specifications, et cetera. Um, translated across into sort of NEC language to make sure it's clear what the various terminology means. So you didn't rewrite your specifications, you yeah. provided a sort of a key to the terms in that linking to NEC, which obviously from what you're saying has proved to be successful in making sure people understand what those different terms are and it's not caused any issues. Yeah, and I've got to say, I don't think myself, Victor, and, and any of the team really spend a lot of time reading the, uh, <laughs> the contract <laughs> because... You can do you can do that. We've all been on contracts where people do that. They're paid to do that, and you get into claims battles, mediation, arbitration. We're, to be honest, we're not interested. We uh, we're working together. Yes, there are issues, but reading clauses and I don't. To be honest, I've never don't think I've ever read the full document. And uh, if I have to, then yeah, there are people I'm working who work for me who can tell me clauses or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's and and and, and unfortunately, you know, I've worked on contracts in Hong Kong where people can tell you all the clauses, all the numbers, blah blah blah, and so on. But I'm I'm personally not that interested in that. I guess using an operational picture? perspective, we've well, seen we always, to help. <laughs> we always want to find the most practical solution <laughs> and the cheapest way to do it, and then have the car be happy if they're happy. Because of course, we we're doing it. We got a paying gain share, and that's a great thing about yeah, option open D, book. open book. And we're working together to to get a benefit. Both of us get the benefit. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, uh, Shai, any final comments before we close from you? Uh, no, no, I agree with all of that. Um, I think the importance of getting the scope or works information correct is also an issue in English contracts. If it's not done properly, you get a mismatch with the main contract, but hopefully people don't do it. Um, and as for the else, I mean, Obviously, true collaboration is trust, and then you're less worried about the contract. And I agree, if people are worried about clauses and how they work as opposed to what's happening on site, then that's not what you're trying to achieve, is it? No, no, totally agree. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Apologies that we've run slightly over time, but hopefully the discussion at the end was useful and informative. Uh, thank you very much for all of our presenters today for the time and effort they put into creating the presentations and joining us for the Q&A session. So thank you, Shai, Katrine, Victor and Daryl for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you.
That's a pleasure. And if you want to rejoin us again, we have another session at 12.30 for the final part of the conference. But a virtual round of applause to all our speakers and our attendees. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, Ian, Thank we'll you. see you back in Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed as you get out there at some contract, point. <laughs> so, are you coming back? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I hope so. As soon as they release the restrictions, you'll see me soon. Yeah. And hopefully in Antwerp yeah, as well. Okay, well, look at <laughs> Thank, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.